has also Shayomeru Kelilas Yopi Masos Lepores. Their heart cried to the Lord, Wall of Zion's daughter, run your tears down like a river day and night. Pour your heart like water in the Lord's presence. Lift your hands toward him for the life of your children. When the prophet Jeremiah composed his lamentations, he stopped at five chapters. He was unable to cry anymore. But after the sheltering spiritual walls of Jerusalem were in ruins, Jeremiah's people, year after year, added chapter after chapter to his book of lamentations. And now, this book has grown too thick and too heavy. In the following film that no one should have had to make, four new chapters that no one should have had to write are added to this thick, heavy book. Where is comfort to be found? The spiritual walls of Jerusalem, which once offered shelter, are still under construction. Jeremiah's people continue to live in a state of vulnerability to the enemy who shoots to kill. But each of these four stories tells us, shows us what it means to build. April 11, 1956, Kfar Chabad, a village in the Lod Valley, eight kilometers from Tel Aviv. It's a Wednesday evening in the synagogue of a small local vocational school. 46 students between the age of nine and 16 have gathered for the evening prayers. They have just finished reciting Shema Israel. Listen, Israel, Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. Two armed Palestinian terrorists enter the synagogue. They open fire. Albert Ederi, 14. Yaakov Harari, 13. Shlomo Mizrahi, 16. Esim Assis, 13. Moshe Peretz, 14, and their teacher, Simha Silberstrom, 25, are killed in cold blood. Another 10 students are wounded. Among them, Kamas Amos Uzan, 15, dies two weeks later in the hospital. The sidurim that drop from the hands of the praying students are open to the page of Hashki Venu. Let us lie down in peace tonight and let us arise tomorrow back to life. But the page is covered in blood and the text is illegible. The Hasidim of Kafar Habad in 1956 had a reputation for being a tough stock. Survivors of Tsar Nikolai's pogroms, of the Second World War, of Stalin's oppressive regime. But with dead bodies of six of their young members before them, the entire village sat paralyzed in despair. Some proposed that the fledgling village be disbanded. It was simply too dangerous to continue. Kobe was killed with Yosef Ishran. Yosef was 14. They were two friends. They just went hiking in the wadi and they were met by terrorists who beat them to death with rocks. May 8, 2001, Tekoa, Gush Etzion, Israel. Two 13-year-old boys, Kobe Mandel and Yosef Ishran, go for a hike in the wadi half a mile from their homes. The canyon in the Judean desert features a series of caves the dead bodies of Kobe and Yosef 
are found in one of these caves. Five Arabs had trapped them there and beat them to death with rocks. The boys were identifiable only by their dental records. It was 7.30 in the morning here, which would be night in Karachi. Uh, I had a dream that I was in a foreign city and just in an alley in one of this Middle Eastern type city that I've been to. And uh, all of a sudden I see Danny really scared. You don't see Danny scared because he was very secure and calm and you, know, you just don't see him. And I said, what happened? February 21st, 2002, we had the news from the FBI people. But I sensed the danger and I sensed the moment. And I never did that before. I went to the computer and wrote an email. Danny humor me, send me an email. And I told him I had this dream and I wrote the word terrorist. And uh, he never got that email. And one day they arrived and they said bad news. Oh, we, we saw they brought a, a doctor with them. So we asked them, is it bad news? They said, yes. And that's how we heard about it. And Yuda and I were sitting in the kitchen for breakfast and she said, turn the stove off. And I said, bad news. She said, yes, but that was the fifth time. So I wasn't sure that I believe it, but this time it was the truth. January 23rd, 2002, Karachi, Pakistan. A Jewish American journalist Daniel Pearl is kidnapped by Pakistani terrorists. My name is Daniel Pearl. I'm a Jewish American from 3545 Bellina Canyon Road in Encino, California, USA. The terrorist group emails a range of demands to the U.S. government, including the freeing of all Pakistani terror detainees. Attached to the email are photos of Pearl handcuffed with a gun to his head and holding up a newspaper. Nine days later, Pearl is decapitated. My father's Jewish. My mother's Jewish. I'm Jewish. They put us on the phone with the American consul in Karachi. And he told me personally the fact that they received the video and then is dead. He also told me the last sentence that he I have said his last words. Um, don't ask me how I felt. You can imagine. I tell you how I felt. A total surprise. Amazement at the fact that I can still move my arm, that the blood flows in my veins, that my biology is not affected by what I heard. I exercise it again and again. I move my arm. It works. It works. I could stand up. I could sit down. That's what amazed me the most. The biology continues. It's unbelievable. The first year I cried every day. I felt like my life was over. I really felt like even my birthday I was happy that I was a year closer to dying because I felt like I can't live like this. This is just too horrible. And then eventually life comes back. Life is very strong, the life force. And when you suffer, suffer traumatic grief, there's also such a thing as post-traumatic growth. And if you can reach that growth, then sometimes you're just too busy to be, to be in pain because you have too much life going on. Right after Kobe was killed, when, I, when we were going to the cemetery and I picked out my hat, I picked out my hat and I thought to myself, you are disgusting that you care what color hat you're going to wear. But that minute I knew you're going to be okay. In 1945, two brothers arrived in Israel after having survived Buchenwald. Both their parents and their brother Shmuel had been killed in European concentration camps. The younger of the two, Yisro Meir, was seven years old. The older, Naftali, was 18. 
Sometime during their initial year in Israel, in 1945, Naftali was taken to meet the Rebbe of Gur, Rabbi Avram Mordecai Alter, whose wife and children had also been killed in concentration camps. The Venerable Rebbe of Gur asked Naftali, Did you see the smoke rising from the chimneys? To see the, the chimneys in Auschwitz from the crematorium, which means the bodies, the corpses, after being dead in the gas chambers, were taken to the crematorium to burn them. Not to bury them, but to burn them. And the chimneys work day and night. Have you seen the chimneys? He said, yes, I did. In your very eyes? Yes. Did you see also the Reboine Shinerum there? He didn't answer enough that. He didn't reply. I understand that the question of the Rebbe was if in spite of seeing such a phenomenon, didn't you lose your faith in the Almighty? You know, I wasn't a person of great faith when my son was killed. I, um, I became religious, and I became religious because my husband was religious, and I liked the lifestyle, you know, I liked Shabbat, and I liked being part of a community. But I really did not feel God. And um, after Kobe was killed, I felt, I mean, this sounds sort of crazy, but I felt like God was communicating with me. You look for God. You look for God in your pain. And it's also, like, I was much more of a shallow person beforehand. I, I was just much, I, I was, it was very easy for me to just, like, you know, go to the beach and read a novel and just relax. And after, the, after Kobe's death, I couldn't. I had to do something greater and more purposeful because I felt like I had to make my life count, but I had to make his life count. And I feel like he keeps pushing us on to do more and more and to keep going. The year Kobe was murdered, Seth and Sherry Mandel established the Kobe Mandel Foundation. Through various programs, such as Camp Kobe, Teen Camp in Israel, Mother's Healing Retreat, Mishnah Marathon. The Foundation runs therapeutic programs for children and adults who have lost a family member to terrorism. To date, more than 2,000 people have participated in the programs. Let's talk about... Danny's inspiration. That's who Danny is. What they did to him doesn't make him who he is. The pain of his loss doesn't help anybody. There are many victims. They're very atrocious, horrifying stories. Let's stick to the inspiration. The Danny Pearl Foundation started a few days after we heard the bad news. Shortly after Daniel's death, his parents founded the Daniel Pearl Foundation. Its mission? To promote cross-cultural understanding through journalism, music, and dialogue. Hello, I'm Christiane Amanpour. The Daniel Pearl Foundation was formed by his family in Danny's memory to further the ideals that inspired his life and his work. In its wake, a number of initiatives followed the Daniel Pearl Memorial Lecture at UCLA. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the Daniel Pearl Memorial Lecture. In partnership with the Foundation, the Daniel Pearl International Journalism Institute at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. The Daniel Pearl Freedom of the Press Act, signed on May 17, 2010, by U.S. President Barack Obama. Our friends, our relatives, they all told us, you can't let it go, you must fight. You must fight the evil that took your son's life. And we felt indeed that this is our way of taking revenge. And the revenge idea is to fight evil with good, to encourage and empower people that are with us, the same ideology 
of uh, humanity, understanding. In 1974, Rabbi Lau revisited Buchenwald. While walking through a former torture chamber, he chanced upon a word on a small cement windowsill, evidently etched into the cement with a fingernail. Nekume, revenge. Nekume, let's translate it into words, revenge, to take revenge. There is very many meanings. What is nekume? What is a kind of a revenge? If you would give me a rifle and show me an old Nazi who have killed my mother in Ravensbrück, shoot at her on the last day of the war, or you would point out about a German, an old one, or a Ukraine one, one of the assistants of the Nazis who pushed my father to the gas chamber in Treblinka. And I have a rifle in my hand. Kill him. Take revenge. Nekume, in Hebrew and Yiddish. I'm not sure that I can press the... and send the bullet. I'm not sure. It will not bring back my father or my mother to this world. For me, Nekume is, in the eternal perspect, they wanted to destroy us and to destroy our heritage. Lechu v'nachide migoi, according to the chapter in the Psalms, let's liquidate the people of Israel from being a nation. Ve'lo yizacher shem Yisrael od. And let's extinguish the candle of Judaism in the world. So the name Israel will not be mentioned anymore. This was the plan. First of all, Jews are very rarely consumed by hate. I mean, I don't think Jews are a hateful people. I know, I, I wasn't brought up religious, but my mother always told me, the, ven the best vengeance is a good life. And Jews are just trained to look at the blessing. It's just, the, you know, it says, like, I, I put before you a blessing and a curse, choose life. L'chaim, like, we are a life-based religion. So there are, you know, exceptions, but most Jews just move toward life. Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau served as Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel from 1993 to 2003. He is presently Chief Rabbi of Tel Aviv. As of 2013, his son, David, is the Ashkenazi Chief Rabbi of Israel. My father was the 37th generation of a rabbinic dynasty in Europe. I am the 38th and the first one who serves in Eretz Israel, not in Europe. My three sons, of the eight children, there are three sons, all the three are Rabbanim, one of them even the chief rabbi. This is a kind of a Nekoma. You wanted to extinguish the candle? You are not here anymore. Seventy years after your defeat, and we, thanks God, multiply and flourish. This is for me, the Nekoma. It's not really, the, in our case, it wasn't a decision. We couldn't consider the other alternative, which was to close in and to despair and to feel victim and to resign to uh, the tragedy and, and to hate. We, we couldn't because we saw that we have effective means to change things. Effective means to empower the forces of good. Rabbi Nisan Mangel was 10 years old when his family was deported from Kosis, Czechoslovakia, and taken to Sered. From the year 1944 until 1945, he was moved around through six concentration camps. Sered, Birkenau, Auschwitz, Mauthausen, Milk, 
and Gunz Kirschen. I had a heavy leather boot and I didn't have any socks. The marching it was January, February, March. And this heavy leather boot bore into my leg, to my foot, and it kept on scraping away the skin, the skin, until the flesh, the muscles, until it scraped away, it bored away until the bone. Eventually, I simply, the pain from the ankle went up all the way to the thigh, I just could not move anymore. This, this foot was completely out of commission. I couldn't move. So I thought to myself, I won't be able to march many m m more miles. Let me just move out a few, a few inches from the line. But you must know that the yak is so punctual. If anybody moved out a few inches from the line, you ought to be shot. That's why you have the piles on both sides. So I thought to myself, let me just move out uh, from the pile, from the line, and I'll be one of those piles upon body. I'll be like. Suddenly, a thought came to my mind. I remembered a Friday night Sude at home in Czechoslovakia. Friday night. It was the custom of my father always to tell stories of Tzadikim. The Hosid came to the Baal Shem Tev. And usually when a Hosid comes to a Rebbe, he stays there for a few days. He was there, and suddenly in the middle of the night, a messenger comes for him, to him, a message from his wife, that unexpectedly she's going to labor. And this was the middle of the night, between Mezibus, where Baal Shem Tev was living. And this town was a dense forest. This forest was at night infested with robbers, gangsters, thieves, rapists. So at, during, at night, people were afraid to go through this forest. During the daytime, many people went, so it wasn't so dangerous. But at night, people uh, were afraid to go. Now his wife asked me should come immediately. So he goes to the Baal Shem, the middle of the night. He says, my wife asked me she should come immediately. She, she's going to labor. But I'm afraid to go alone. So Baal Shem Tev said, since your wife needs you, go immediately. Insofar as you say that you are afraid to go alone, a Jew never goes alone. You understand what Baal Shem Tev meant? A Jew never goes alone, it's always Hashem goes with him. And suddenly this story, this moral, this teaching came to me. Suddenly I, I remembered it. This gave me such a strength that I'm not alone. And I decided not to, this, that to move out. And I continue push because Hashem will help me. In the days following the murders in Kafar Chabad, the Rebbe sent words of solace by telegram and by post to the villagers. Immediately following the Shiva, a long message from the Rebbe arrived containing the following words. I strongly hope that with the help of Hashem, who guards with a wise eye and oversees with personal supervision, you will overcome every obstacle, strengthen both personal and communal affairs, and expand all the organizations in quantity and quality. Three words stood out from all the communiques, as if summing up the Rebbe's essential message. In continuing to build, you will be comforted. I would say that our lives were totally broken when Kobe was killed, and thank God we had other children. Um, and it's a real challenge to find wholeness, because you don't find wholeness in the same way. But there are, are opportunities. My point is that tragedy always brings an opportunity, and you have a choice of whether you utilize the opportunity or you just um, despair with the tragedy. And in our case, it so happens that because Danny became an icon to so many ideas, and because he became a symbol of, uh, of East-West meeting, 
And because he was respected on both sides of the East-West divide, that we have the opportunity now to bring his message and our message to the world. We have an opportunity and we can't let it go. Hope against hope. Never give up. People who in Auschwitz or any other death camps, if the person says, I will not survive, it's impossible. Odds against odds. I cannot endure the suffering. He would in this moment give up. This will be the end. So a sufferer knows what was the key, the secret of his survival. Tracht gut, but sein gut. Think good, think positively. And the Rebbe emphasizes time and time again. It's a very important lesson. Tracht gut, don't give up. You see you to succeed. Push, keep on. Don't, don't give up. Yes, push ahead. It was the beginning of the Intifada. So every day there were terrorist attacks. And I would go to Shiva's and I would just be there for other people. And I, I felt like I had a presence that I could make myself available for other people. And that in that way, there was some kind of purpose to my pain, that it wasn't for nothing, that I, I could just be there to, to give to other people who, who were going through the pain that I, I was still experiencing. Because History, if you want, you can say God has given us this, um, I wish not say upon this call, calling, and this job to perform that we cannot let go. We feel that we are soldiers in the army of civilization, and we cannot betray that calling, so we must continue. I was asked a number of times, after what I went through, all these experiences, these horrible, horrible things, don't you have nightmares? That the middle of the night shakes you up and starts screaming? Let me tell you in complete truth, Never, it's already over 70 years, yes? I never had one night I couldn't sleep because the nightmare woke me up. I never had anything bad dreams, bad okay, events should come to me what I went through. Why is it? Because I always had in the back of my mind it's whatever Hashem does, it's only for the good. I came home, my hair didn't grow. My nails, did, my, my nails didn't grow. I was so emaciated, except the skin and the bone. There was no muscles. It took months and months before my hair began, began to grow. But I did not have emotional and I still had alone, no spiritual trauma at all whatsoever. The moon had kept them then and the moon keeps them out also. Today, Rabbi Mangel is a noted scholar, author, and lecturer who inspires audiences around the globe with his message of hope, resilience, and purpose. His last sentence is resonating in the mind of many Jews, and we would like it to resonate in the mind of uh, young Jewish kids. My father's Jewish. My mother's Jewish. I'm Jewish. In the town of Bnei Brak in Israel, there's a street called uh, Chaim Pearl Street, which is named after my gran great grandfather, who was one of the founders of it. I'm Jewish. My father is Jewish. My mother is Jewish. And I'm Jewish. And back in the town of Bnei Brak, there is a street named after my great grandfather, Chaim Pearl who was one of the founders of the town. And that for us means everything. It encapsulates, I don't know how he fell into that kind of memory because we hardly spoke about this street in Pnei Brak. I think we visited it only, only once and we talked about it maybe twice. 
but somehow in, in this critical moment of one's life, the mind uh, works in strange ways. And he just fell onto that particular incident or memory that symbolizes everything that you can imagine about Judaism. It's the historical continuity. I'm not here as one person. I represent a movement, an idea. You know, my grand grandfather, he came to Israel not to look for oil or minerals. He came there because he wanted to rebuild the city of Bnei Brak, where Rabbi Akiva established his place of learning. And he was one of the founder of the town. We are the founders of towns. And we build, we don't destroy. His great-grandfather, Mr. Pell Oliver Scholler, came from Poland, I think from Warsaw, and was one of the founders of the city of Bnei Brak. This is a fact, a piece of the history of Bnei Brak. And I think there is a street carrying his name. He was killed by whom? Daniel Pell. Islamic. Yeah. He saw in this last moment that this is the classic war between the Jewish people and the Jewish faith to so those parts of the Islam, the fundamentalist Islam, like the, the Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and today Hamas and ECC, who want to destroy not only the Jewish physically, the Jewish state, of course, as their home, and the Jewish heritage as a religion, as a faith. So he understood that in the last moment he can give a declaration. He said, I am in the front line of this battlefield, the historic one. My grandfather came as a Jew to build a part of the Jewish home. In 2009, on Simhat Torah, Daniel's birthday, Chabad synagogues throughout the world took part in an initiative, the Daniel Pearl Hakafa, a circuit of joyful dancing with the Torah in hand, in the memory of a Wall Street Journal reporter whose last words attested to his Jewish identity. Yeah, we have a, a Simchat Torah, we have a Hakafot anyhow, and we are dancing anyhow, I'm saying. It would be great if we dedicate one of the Hakafa to Daniel and to his last stand for Kiddush Hashem and what it means to us, what it means to Jewish kids. And I insist on that the Jewish kids must know what he stood, that one of them stood there in Karachi facing the weapons of those terrorists and said, I'm Jewish. You can jump all over the place, but I'm Jewish. And I'm not saying it in defiance. I'm saying it because it's a fact. Like two and two is equal to four. And if you have any problem with that, you have to cope with it. It's your problem. That was his stand. And that's the kind of resiliency we would like to impart to Jewish kids. I feel like Kobe's vision lives on because he knew that being a Jew and living in Israel was the most important thing for a Jewish person. And being connected to Torah and learning, because he loved learning, he loved Gemara. And I think that continues because every time that we talk, I, I almost always say that Kobe was killed for being a Jew. And that the most important thing that people can do in response to that is to become more Jewish. We are the builders in the world. We build towns and we don't um, express our grievances in violence. But in building towns and building countries, that's who we are. That's one, perhaps one idea that subconsciously came to his mind. In the winter before the attack, the Rebbe had encouraged the expansion of the vocational school. Following the attack, the Rebbe urged that the expansion be broadened and accelerated. After 30 days, a groundbreaking was held for a major expansion. A large campus 
with multiple buildings for a variety of vocational schools would be built where children from disadvantaged families would be schooled and trained. Not long thereafter came the holy day of Shavuot, during which the Rebbe announced to us Hasidim that they should enlist for a special mission to Israel, a special shlichus. Twelve young men were selected, with a strong sense of the sacred profundity of this mission. These twelve young emissaries traveled to Kafar Habad and throughout Israel to offer words of encouragement, to give public addresses and classes, and to personally embody the message of the Rebbe. This mission proved to be a watershed moment in the history of Habad Shlichus, a key step in the Rebbe's mobilization of an army of kindness. I think the wisdom of a broken heart is that you know that life is short and you know that life is limited. I feel like after Kobe was killed, before that I, I had this feeling that life was unlimited and that there was such a grandeur to life. I mean, I still feel there is, but after Kobe was killed, I felt its limits and I felt my limits and that death was real and that death was there for everybody. I mean, we all live as if we're not going to die because that's the only way we can. But when you're faced with the death of a child, part of you has died. So you never, I never have that total comfort in this world because I'm connected to the world to come. And so that connection to the world to come gives me a different truth in this world because I'm not fully in this world. I can tell you one thing, that the man who is suffering, who is in a trouble, he understands better than the others that all these materialistic accomplishments of this world is nothing, is zero. It must be something spiritual, which is the real world. This brings him for thinking about the future, about the redemption of the Jewish people, about the fulfillment of the prophecies of all the prophets we have mentioned and we didn't mention yet. Because he is in such a situation that he understands that in God we trust, but not the dollar is the God. We learn that in Gan Eden Mamala, in the Garden of Eden, like the highest, deepest place in like the spiritual world, it says that there's a bird's nest. And then it says, in that bird's nest, the Messiah waits to redeem the world. And he flies in and out of the nest, waiting to see if the world is ready. And in that bird's nest are pictures of all the children that died, Kiddush Hashem pictures of all the children that died sanctifying God's name. So after I learned that, I felt that Kobe's death was part of Jewish history. And it was part of this transcendent reality that, that I couldn't really understand, but that we were now part of a bigger story. A prophet among the exiles in Babylon, Ezekiel comforts his people with the messianic promise, the messianic vision of a new heart. Lev Hadash. A man, a woman, a human being of flesh and blood can only manage so much by way of repairing a broken heart. But with God, promises Ezekiel, with God all things are possible. God brings the dead back to life. God replaces the broken with the new. And I will give you a new heart, and I will place a new spirit inside you. Then the nations left around you will know that I, Hashem, have built the ruined places. God sends His Anointed One, Moshiach, to comfort all. Of us, all that is asked is that we continue building, deed by deed. Jeremiah raised a bitter lament for Jerusalem, but he did not eulogize. 
for our people is eternally alive. In exile, our sages explain, God is with us. His infinite light pours into the cracks of our shattered hearts. Individually and as a community, we are empowered to clear away the darkness by building a brighter universe. At a Log Bomer parade outside Chabad World Headquarters in 1984, the Rebbe assured thousands of assembled youths that God has always been at our side and always will be. To know this, to be comforted and strengthened by this assurance, is what will take us through the final days of exile into the age of Mashiach, the era that knows only goodness. As a need of Pshat has we shown, as a year gefins in Golus, and the Rebister gefins in sein palace in the Himmel, and cook zu von eben, was er tut sich mit a jeden unten, und geht ein Broches, so klebt Schimmen bei euch nie das in der Ruftu. Der Ruftu ist a der Rebister gefins, und dort muss er gefins, jeder Rieb. Und ich hasse a jeder gefind sich in Golus, ich schiene immer. Ich hasse a jeden Wert eng, mach mal die Mine von Golus. Zieh das Wert der Engkeit in Ruchnis, oder a viele Begaschmius, ich so dämmel sorg der Ewigster, a sehr hoch dieselbe Leiden, mit dieselbe Schwerkeit, mit dieselbe Engkeit, wo das jetzt so rauskommt. Von Akiden, Begolus, wo der Funde doch verstandig, auf wie viel Behör die Sijua, die Hilfe von den Mäbischen, auf wie viel kommen die alle Schwierigkeiten, worin der Rebischer oder sich qua Jochla reingestellt, als er hat dieselbe Schwierigkeiten und war fahre doch verstandig die Stadlus von den Mäbischen, and the people will come to us freer. They will be able to get to us and get to us. And they will be able to get to us. And they will cry in the Mosai. When the people will come to the people, and the people will be able to get to us. And they will be able to get to us. And all the people will be able to get to us. Thank you.